If you would, open up to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Starting in verse 15 this morning, through the rest of the book of Acts, really for the next seven and a half, you could almost call it eight chapters, it's going to cover a chronology of about four and a half to five years. And as this journey goes on, as it starts, Paul's going to make a journey to Jerusalem. You know the prophecies that have been made about him in this trek to Jerusalem. He's going to be there for a while. Then he's going to go to Caesarea, going to be imprisoned there for two years. And then he's going to be moved. He's going to stay in another place for about three months. Excuse me. Then he's going to go down. He's going to be moved to another place. And then to be shipwrecked for about, uh, about three months and then to even eventually end up in Rome when you get over to chapter 28, and he's going to be there under house arrest for about two years. The story, that's kind of things in a nutshell, is, is where we're going in, through the rest of the book of Acts. And to realize all these events, you're going to see they cover about four and a half years. Um, you see two times where it mentions two years, so you add that up to four Another time where there's three months where they're wintering in the island of Malta in chapter 28. So that gets you to, to four and a quarter. All the other events probably take anywhere from three to nine months. So you realize four and a half to five years is the span of time. And you think about how much can change in our lives in five years. And to go, here you see what Paul's doing and to see his aim. Now, if you notice, we just left since uh, Caesarea uh, in the last, uh, last week that we were here together. Chapter, chapter 21, verse 15. After these days, we got ready. And notice Luke's on board with this, too. You're going to see a lot of we's uh, as we go on. Luke's going to endure through this all the way to Rome with Paul. He says, after these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Now, from Caesarea to Jerusalem is about 57 miles as the crow flies. At least that's how we say it in Tennessee. The straight path. There is not a straight path from Caesarea to Jerusalem. It's roughly about 75 to 80 miles to travel. So realize it's some distance. Um, and of course, you know, you're only going by either walking or maybe by muleback, horseback, whatever. Then verse 16. He says, some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us taking us to Mason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. Mason, and it's pronounced like the end's not there. Mason is probably somebody partially of the way between Caesarea and Jerusalem because the very next verse is going to say, after we arrived in Jerusalem, and so you're going to realize these saints in Caesarea were so concerned and loving of Paul and they said, we'll travel with you just so that we can introduce you to Mason so that you'll have a place to stay along the way. And just kind of see the tenderness of that. And to go, would we be somebody who goes, you know, I'd, I'd walk 40 miles just so that you can have a place to, place to stay with someone that is familiar? I mean, that's quite a sacrifice, right? I mean, sometimes it's like, you want me to walk a mile? I mean, whenever Jesus was talking... He says, you know, if someone asks you to walk a mile with them, go with them too. Here's a situation where the saints in Caesarea are saying, we'll walk with you just so that we can introduce you to Mason. And Mason is from the island of Cyprus, but that's not the direction they're going. So you look at this and go, you see the amount of love that the saints in Caesarea have for Paul. And to go, well, sure, the Lord just take care of him. They decide, hey, some of the disciples, they came along also with us. He says, they took us to Mason of Cyprus, which just tells you where he's from, the island of Cyprus out in the Mediterranean Sea. A disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. And apparently Mason was somebody that was well known. At least he'd been a, a, a disciple or a saint for quite some time. Verse 17. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So they finally make their way through this trek to get to Jerusalem. And the brethren that are there in Jerusalem are seemingly pretty happy to see them. If you think back through the book of Acts, 
you remember how long it's been since Paul's been in Jerusalem? I know that's kind of a circumspect kind of question. But if you go back in Acts chapter 15, whenever there was the big concern about whether the, the Gentiles would have to be circumcised in order to be saved, that kind of council or gathering that took place in Jerusalem in Acts 15, it's at the very beginning of 16 is whenever you see that, that Paul and them have already left Jerusalem. So Acts 15 is the last time that Paul has been there in Jerusalem. So this is, it's been a while. And to come back, and here he is, and the, the saints there are glad to see him. So it's been quite some time. Verse 18. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now, what James are we talking about? That's a good, <laughs> Janet says, I don't know. I was going to ask that. Well, let me kind of help you work this out. In Acts chapter 12, James, the brother of John, was killed with the sword by Herod. So you know it's not, it's not, it's not James, the son of Zebedee. There are two apostles by the name of James. Can you remember the other one? James, the son of Alphaeus. And you can go back in Mark chapter 3 and read about that. So you go, okay, James, the son of Zebedee, has already, has already been martyred by Herod. Now you come back, and here's James. In all likelihood, this is James, the son of Alphaeus. I know sometimes people want to say, well, couldn't this be uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus? It could. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a betting man. I'm not going to bet my soul on this. But to go, okay, it just makes sense. Then he says, and all the elders were present, which tells you why I set James apart if he's not really an apostle. But anyway, he says, and all the elders were present. So everybody together again, verse 19. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. If you remember, and this is kind of going back to the chronology of Acts. By Acts 15, Paul had already made his first missionary journey that went to the island of Cyprus, that went up into Asia Minor. After he had been there in Jerusalem in Acts 15, Paul goes on all the, the second missionary journey that goes up into Macedonia, over to Greece, his third missionary journey that covers a lot of Asia Minor, all these Gentiles that have been converted over those, those journeys. And now when he comes back to them, you think about what it's taken us a while to go through and study. Everything from Acts chapter 16 all the way up to here in Acts 21, all those stories are what Paul is telling them about. All those events, all the difficulties, how the Lord took care of them, how the Gentiles have been converted, to now they're really responding to, to Jesus and by faith and these promises that are coming. And you think about having all those stories shared with you and going, man, wouldn't that be something to hear? It's, it's pretty wonderful to get to read about, but just imagine having Paul tell you these stories firsthand. You think you might have a few more questions along the way? You probably would, but anyway. So here he is, he's telling them about, about what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. There's one little thing I want you to point out for sure. Notice who he is not pointing to. <laughs> himself. You notice who he's claiming did these things? God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. He says, look at who brought it about. Paul says, I got to serve. But look at what God was doing. And uh, I kind of appreciate whenever uh, missionaries come in and they want to talk about what God has done in these countries. It's just kind of one of those little things that you pay attention to and you appreciate. You know, look at the way they put the emphasis on what God is doing. Not, well, here's what we did. Here's, what, here's how it turned out. Come on, this is what the Lord allowed us to achieve, allowed things to work together. Then notice how he continues, verse 20. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. 
I want to take half a second here to point out some grammar, which I know you're super excited about. <laughs> but so oftentimes through the book of Acts, it'll make a statement similar to what's at the beginning of verse 20, which says, and when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And then it's going to give you an explanation of how they were glorifying God. This is not one of those situations. Because if you notice, the next thing they come up with is a question. They don't say, and praise the Lord for what he has done. They come up with something different. So just kind of notice, and when they heard it, they began glorifying God. That's kind of the completion of the thought. And then they said, and he says, if you notice the way it's just kind of written out, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Now, I want you to hear those two statements. He says, man, it's amazing how many thousands of Jews have come to faith. They've come to believe. But they also have what? They're still zealous for the law. I mean, they're really gung-ho about Old Covenant. Now, I just want you to think about those two things together, because what are you really saying about these Jewish believers? Right, they don't fully understand it all, so what would you kind of tag them as? They're in Christ, but what would you say about them? Doubtful. Babes, weak, and you go immature, and you think, have thousands, it says thousands of Jews who have believed, but man, they're still zealous for the law. I want you to just, let's just kind of brainstorm for a second. Thousands of Jews who believe that they're in Christ, and yet so many of them are still zealous for the law. What are the pros to that? We're going to talk about the cons here in a minute. But what are the pros to that? They have zeal. And even in having zeal for the law, if it can be directed right to see what the law was really for, to lead them to Christ, that the law was really to point to Jesus being the perfect sacrifice, that to go, you know what, now we have a higher standard of what we've been called to be. I mean, Old Covenant, top two commandments are, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus comes in, things change. It's not about those things. It's about, I want you, number one, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. But I want you to love your neighbor as I have loved you. Is that a higher standard? Yeah. Did the Jews need to see that there's a higher standard? Yes. Now, you see this and you go, man, it's great that these people, these, these, these Jews have come to faith, they believe, they are, they are so zealous for the law, but then you look at that and you go, okay, if it can be directed, if people can actually help, because keep in mind, they don't have the New Testament to read. They can't be, um, this is a bad term, but they can't be self-taught. There has to be someone to show these things. Here's the other side. We talk about the pros. What are the cons of having thousands of Jews who believe and have come to faith in Christ, but they're zealous for the law? What's the difficulty to overcome? Their traditions, they're going back maybe to some old things and going, how easy would that be to just kind of try to slide back into being accepted and to kind of mold and change. Karen, I see your hand up. And it brings up some questions. Do they fully understand? Now, here's the part we need, I just want to take a moment on. They have faith in Christ. They've responded to the gospel. Do they have salvation? Yeah. I mean, whenever we were babes in Christ, didn't we have salvation? And didn't we also need to grow? Now, we probably didn't come with going, you know what, we're real zealous about the old covenant and, and all those things. 
But did we too have some things that we held on to from the past that needed to change? Even in terms of our standard of what we thought was right and good. And realize, no, here's God's standard of what's right and good. So you realize, we've kind of lived through this too, just not so much with the law. So just kind of understand, here they are, and they're starting to come to some questions. Then, verse, verse 21. He says, and they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Well, guess who they've been talking about? Paul. Now, they're still so, some of these Jewish converts are still so zealous about the law that they've heard about Paul and what is he not doing from what they've heard. Hey, circumcision is not a part of this. You don't have to follow the customs. And if you kind of take a thought here, he says, they've been told about you, which also tells you a little bit about Paul. Um, he didn't live under a rock. I mean, people knew. In the same way that whenever people see the actions that we take, they may not listen so much to the words that are said, but that people pay attention to actions. And you go, woo, the reputation is being built one way or the other. Then he says that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Now, here's what's kind of something. For the Jews, I mean, probably the greatest heroes of the Old Testament to the Jews, Abraham, Moses, and you could probably throw in David. Wouldn't you kind of think those are probably the top three for the Jews? And to be told, you know what, Moses, you don't have to listen to Moses anymore. Now, here's another thought. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John go up on top of the mountain, and all of a sudden, here they are, and they actually fall asleep. And they're tired. And all of a sudden, whenever they wake up, they notice that here's Jesus, and he is a glow. He's in his glory. I mean, his garments are white like no launderer could make them, which tells you it's beyond something that humans could do. And there with him is Moses and Elijah. If you remember, God speaks from, from, the, from the cloud that overshadows says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him over Elijah? Yes. Listen to him over Moses? Yes. And even Moses prophesied about Jesus saying, there's going to come a prophet and you better pay attention to everything he says or you will be condemned. You go, hey, maybe we need to listen. And you realize... Yeah, listen to Moses. Because who's Moses going to tell you about? Jesus. You see, that old covenant can be used to really put the spotlight right on Jesus to see and magnify him. But these Jews weren't doing that because they didn't know enough. They were just going back to hold on to those customs and the law. So, you might think here, and I want you to kind of notice a couple other things here in verse 21. He says, teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Is it true that Paul was completely against circumcision? No. You remember the story in Acts chapter 16. There's a young man by the name of Timothy who Paul desires to go with him, but Timothy's father's a Greek, so he wasn't circumcised when he was eight days old. And since Paul knows that they're getting ready to go off to be teaching the gospel in, with the Jews in synagogues and other places, he's going to need to be circumcised. And so that's what, and Paul actually says, and he's circumcised. And you realize, what was the point? We don't want to hinder the gospel, right? And to go, and we'll choose to do this. Now, here's the other aspect. Is Paul 
probably telling people you don't need to circumcise your child on the eighth day. We don't really have any, any teachings in particular where he said that, but that would make sense. Um, but I, I do want you to kind of notice something else. Let's, let's take these thoughts all together and go back just a little bit. Look back at Matthew chapter 15. Let's let Jesus instruct. Matthew chapter 15. I don't necessarily want to read all of this. But look down at verse 6. The Pharisees and scribes have come to Jesus. Uh, this takes place in, uh, it says they were from Jerusalem. And they're saying, how come your disciples break the traditions of the elders? How come you're not holding to our customs? And, of course, Jesus tells them, Matthew chapter 15, look kind of halfway through verse 6, where it starts in, with and by this. He says, and by this you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Is it okay? Is it okay to have customs and traditions that invalidate the word of God? Yes. Certainly not. Now, notice verse 7. Jesus is pretty straightforward here. He says, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. Now, do you remember what the word hypocrite literally means in, the, in its origin of words? An actor. It's someone who, literally, someone who pretends to be what they never really truly intend to be. We're, we're putting on a facade is what it is. And Jesus says, that's who you are. You're just a bunch of actors in a play. You're acting spiritual, but what's on the inside? You're dead. Because look at where he goes next. He says, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. You know, pro you know Isaiah, like, 600 years ago. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. What's the problem? Heart. He says, you know what? They say the right things out of their lips like an actor would. They've got the lines to repeat, but the heart's not in it. These aren't words that come out, and we know the words of Jesus. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Can you come up with false ones, though? Can you start saying words that you don't really mean out of the abundance of your heart? Yeah, what do you call that kind of person? Hypocrite. We're pretending to be something that we're genuinely not. Then, notice how they got that way. Verse 9. Whenever that's the case, when it's just lip service, not heart, here's verse 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. What does hypocritical worship bring about? It's all in, it's all in vain. It's all worthless. If it's just about saying the words, then our worship has no value before God. Then notice this other aspect, which will also make worship in vain. Teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. If you're just going to go around teaching what man desires, what does it do to the worship? It'll make it void. It'll make it in vain. It'll make it useless. Now, you kind of stop and go through this and realize, does it matter what's being taught whenever we gather for worship? It does. Now, you also realize there can be times where it's not as if God's saying, okay, everybody's condemned because of this terrible preacher or whatever, but going, you know what? You better be careful about following the teachings of Jesus. And whenever people want to veer away after their own thinking and their own commands and their own ways, notice what Jesus recognizes. Does it affect the relationship? He says, your worship's in vain if it's just lip service. He says, if the heart's not in this, to truly go after what God desires, he says, you're invalidating the word of God for the sake of your traditions. I don't know if you've ever been in, a, in an assembly where somebody makes some 
some statement that you know, like that goes against this scripture and this scripture and this scripture, and you realize, you know what, what are they doing? They're invalidating God's word for the sake of what they think and what they want. You realize, oh, let's see, what would God say about that? Hypocrite? Sometimes, though, it can be just because of immaturity. So have room for mercy. But just understand what's, what's at play here. So Jesus is saying, we've got to talk about heart. The precepts of men, the perceptions, does that give you a better idea? What man perceives to be right rather than what God truly says. Um, you might even could use the word man's logic. Uh, man's logic gets in the way a lot. Um, now, notice what's at hand here, heart. Look over at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Just look at verses 28 and 29. Paul writing to the saints there in Rome. He says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Does it matter whether you're circumcised or not in the flesh? Nope. You can easily see why Paul would be telling, you don't have to circumcise your children anymore. And if you go back to Genesis, what was circumcision really about? What was the promise that was tied to circumcision? All right, a covenant. Do you remember who the covenant was with? Where it started? Abraham. And the promise about circumcision was, I will give you the promised land to your descendants. Abraham himself was not even going to inherit a foot of ground. But your descendants will have this. And so circumcision was handed down. Circumcision, since it started with Abraham, came a long time before Moses and the law. But you see those things continue and realize, all right, circumcision was a promise, a land promise, of what we know of as Canaan or, or Palestine. So he says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, here's the payoff. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. You mean it's not about the externals? It's about inwardly? He says, and circumcision is that which is of the heart. It's not just for the men folk anymore. Now it is for all. Because this is a circumcision of the heart. And why does the heart need to be circumcised? Because it's hard and calloused. And it needs to come down to something that is alive and tender. You can maybe even think about Ephesians 4.32. talks about be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Can saints become hard-hearted too? Yes. But notice also here. Who is the one who circumcises the heart? Spirit of God. So tell me, when does that circumcision take place? Baptism. Because that's whenever the Spirit of God comes to dwell in the heart, right? But before the Spirit dwells there, what happens? There's a circumcision of the heart. Now, here's the other, other part of it. He says, he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, not by law. He says, and his praise is not from men, but from God. When righteousness was based on law, who was the praise from? Men. Righteousness is now based upon Jesus and his Spirit. And going, you walk by the Spirit? He says, what's God going to say about you? You are my child. And you also think about, your praise comes from God. I'll just give you a parallel here and hope this, we don't stumble over this. 
Outward circumcision was a promise to Abraham for his descendants to inherit the promised land. Circumcision of the heart also comes with a land promise. What land are we talking about? Eternity, right? How's that for a promise? There's a circumcision that we want of the heart to walk according to the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean all those Jews back there that believed understood all that. But come back over to, to Acts chapter, chapter 21. So when you, to pull all these things together in verse 21, he says, they have been told about you. In other words, Paul had been talking about you, and they have been told, warned about you almost. He says that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. You don't, you don't have to worry about following Moses. Tell them not to circumcise their children. You can understand why, because that promise was already given. Then, he says, nor to walk according to the customs. Notice it doesn't say according to the law. It says according to the customs, like the perceptions of men, like their traditions. And tradition is a word that can be used both ways. Uh, so you just have to be careful about context. There are traditions that Paul had that were scriptural in, in our terms from God. There are other traditions that were just man-made, things that come up. Then, notice how we continue, verse 22. What then is to be done? In other words, since they think this about you, what should we do? He says, they will certainly hear that you have come. He says, therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Now, he comes to this part, and he says, this is the way people are going to perceive you. What should we do? Because they're not on your side. They're not going to be there to support you. They would probably rather you die not necessarily the saints, the death is going to come from the unbelieving Jews. But you can see there's some misconception about things. And whenever we are young in the faith, how many misconceptions do we have? <whistles> Too many to count, right? That's part of being young. And it shows the patience of God with us and the patience we should have with each other. Now, if you notice it here, he says, Therefore, do this that we tell you. He says, we've got an idea for you, and we, we think it will work out well. He says, we have four men who are under a vow, and you can go back and look at it in Acts 18. Paul actually shaved his head for a vow while he was in Caesarea. And so, you know, a vow is a vow. Um, vows can be things in terms of a dedication to God. You'll see that they've been there for about seven days um, whenever we get down to verse 27. But here's the other aspect. We, we've already looked at it. I know Brent preached to it on Sunday, and I'm glad that he got to it first because last week I thought, if we get too far, I'm going to get ahead of him. But I want you to think about what they're really proposing to do here. Do they know that these old customs, that the law is not what to, is to be held to anymore? Does Paul know that? Does James know that? Do the elders know that? Yeah, they know that. But they also know they're dealing with other Jews. And they're dealing with weak Jews. And so they decide, we're going to love. And we're not going to give a hindrance to the gospel. If you're taking notes, write down 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, where Paul says, to the Jews, I became a Jew, so that I might win a Jew, another soul. So you realize, this is what they're proposing to do, and this is what's going to happen. Notice verse 24. Take them and purify them um, along, take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. He says, Go in, and that's how they kept a vow. It was, if you want to go back to, to Numbers chapter 6, you can read about Nazarite vows. Um, Jesus was from the town of Nazareth. Remember what Nazareth means? Dedication. Isn't that kind of fitting? Wouldn't you say Jesus was dedicated to God? Like on a whole new level? Makes sense that he grew up in Nazareth. Well, Nazarites were those who dedicated themselves you might think in terms of some good examples and some bad examples. 
Samson, a Nazarite, God gave him strength so long as he kept his hair, which was part of the vow of what he was told, what even his, his mother and father were told he should do. And Samson has his weaknesses, and you probably know that story. There's another man in the New Testament who's a Nazarite. Uh, you might not know him by that name, but his name is John the Baptist. He wasn't going to partake of the things of the, of the grape and, and some other aspects there. No strong drink, no wine. You can read more about that in Luke chapter 1. But to go, this thing about the hair, you're making a vow of whatever it is. And it's not always about dedication to God, but it could be. And whenever you made the vow, you would cut all the hair off your head. And however long that vow was for, and it's not a set number of days, um, but you think about if you made the vow for 30 days, something that you were or were not going to do, well, your hair would grow out for 30 days. And then at the end of that time that you had dedicated to the Lord, because that's the idea about Nazarite, a dedication, you would then take that hair and that would be part of the sacrifice that would be offered after, the, after you had kept your vow. So that's probably a little bit more than what you really wanted to know, but, but, but that's there. So here they are. And so just keeping a vow. He says, we have four men who are under a vow. He says, Pay their expenses, you know, let their heads be shaved, pay for what it costs. It does, I guess it costs money for a haircut back then, too. Um, he says, and all will know that there's nothing to the things which they have been told about you. You ever have people tell you just horrible things about somebody, and then you meet them, and you go, what's wrong with, with the people who are telling me this? Because sometimes you get bad reports. Sometimes you get people who make assumptions on things, and they don't really know the truth. And to go, well, man, we've, we've met Paul. We saw him in the temple. I mean, he was purifying himself, um, took the bath before he went in. I mean, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you're getting your information. Let me make my own judgment. Yeah, and then let God make the judgment. Then notice how he continues. Uh, verse 25, he says, But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. When's the last time you heard those four things? The last time Paul was in Jerusalem, back in Acts chapter 15. He says, what's the instruction? He says, can you be saved and without being circumcised? Certainly you can, in a physical circumcision, because that's what they were, the Jews were talking about. And he says, here's what you tell the Gentiles. Don't eat any meat to sacrifice to idols. He says, make sure you don't eat any blood or drink any blood. He says, can't eat anything that's strangled, and certainly stay away from sexual immorality, fornication. He says, those are the things we have to make sure to hold to. They're not traditions. He says, this is the idea of what you have to do uh, as a Gentile coming in. Then, um, verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of days of purification, though the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. So what does Paul do? He does it. He's going, you know what, do I have to do this? No. But why is he going to do it? For the sake of, of the souls of, of the Jews who have heard this wrong information, for the sake of the Jews who have not come to Christ, to not be a hindrance to them, you see kind of different levels of this. And so here's what takes place. And everything is fine and dandy for seven days. In other words, the plan was good. Do you have a question? It's just an animal sacrifice. It, don't think of it in terms of this is their appeal to God for these things. It's like... But they think that's what that is, don't they? They think that. So, so that that's not right, correct? I mean, it's just a sacrifice. It, you, you have to realize, does the Old Covenant have a mediator? No. Nope. It's all for nothing, right? Yeah, so it's not actually... Don't, don't think of it as... Now they're turning back to Judaism. Go, you know what, these were just sacrifices. And the sacrifices weren't always animal sacrifices. Sometimes it was just a matter of giving so much um, 
food or drink or something, a meal, different, different aspects of it. And so um, don't think in terms of they're abandoning this and going back to that, but going, here they are going, we know that this doesn't mean anything before God in terms of what's going on here. So we'll walk through it just so that we're not a hindrance to open up and go, you know what, you can come and learn about Jesus and truly see who he is. But I, I see what you're saying. It, yeah. This seems like, are they going back to, to do all these things? And this is, and remember, this is for a vow. This is not a sin offering. This is not a trespass offering. This is just a typical offering for keeping a vow, for keeping your word, or whatever was promised. I'm just, I think I'm having trouble with the, the word sacrifice. Right. I want them to go back to an old lifestyle of sin. Right. And, and just remember, it's not a sin offering. It's not a trespass offering. It's not a supplant, supplanting of Jesus kind of sacrifice. It's just fulfilled a vow. So they cut off their hair, and the hair would be burned as part of the sacrifice. Um, That was all there in, in Acts 15. If you remember, whenever they had the council, they had, they had Paul there, they had Barnabas there, they had Silas there. They also had the elders of Jerusalem. All the apostles are there, except for, of course, uh, James, the son of uh, Zebedee, who had already been killed. But everybody's on hand, and this is what they all come together with, the conclusion. And they wrote it in a letter. And so Paul and Silas take this letter to all these different Gentiles along the way as they go. So it's written by a, con uh, by a council, if you want to. It's not just one person. Maybe that, maybe that helps answer that question. Then notice verse 27. He says, when the seven days were almost over, and I almost hear like, you hear the music of going, and everything was peaceful and wonderful. He says, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him, Paul, in the temple began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him. The troublemakers show up. And if you notice, they're not locals. They came from Asia. And you can think of the seven churches of Asia to give you a pretty good idea. Places like, they, they could have come from any of those spots. It doesn't say where exactly. You know, Ephesus would have been a spot. Uh, Laodicea, Smyrna, Philadelphia. You can just kind of list off those places. Somewhere in that area of, of Asia Minor. He says, and whenever they see him in there, I mean, notice, they don't go, oh, let's go talk to him. What do they do? This is how troublemakers work, isn't it? Well, let's go talk to everybody else but the one person we have trouble with. And they stir up the crowd, and then they laid hands on him. And that doesn't mean, oh, we're going to pray for you. I mean, they grab him up, verse 28, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. Like, it's almost like the bomb is here. You better catch it and throw it out before it goes off. He says, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law in this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. How much of that's true? None of it. But boy, people can raise a big stink over nothing, can't they? Or things they've made up. Let's not call it nothing. Then, and here's where they got this. And man, I hope we can, we can pick up the lesson here. Verse 29. And here's why they make this statement. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian. Now, Ephesus is in Asia. So Trophimus is somebody they would know by sight. Somebody would. Seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city. Notice, not in the temple. They saw Trophimus with Paul in the city with him, and they supposed, and I'm going to nail on that one here in a second, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. How many times do we shoot ourselves in the foot and sometimes higher because of something we suppose to be the case? Be very careful with your mouth. Don't share things that you suppose to be the case unless you tell somebody, and maybe it's not even wise to say this. This is just what I suppose. 
Because sometimes even telling somebody, this is only what I suppose, and they go back and say, well, Carrie said that this is the... I didn't say that. <laughs> and you realize, this is one of those things, how long have suppositions been getting people in trouble? Forever. For a long time. Which also tells us, no wonder Paul goes out of his way in Ephesians 4, the very first attribute of talking about putting on the new self after we come into Jesus, speak the truth with one another. He says, don't go around spreading things that you just suppose is the case, because you're really going to stir up a lot of trouble. And not only for you, but for the other person too. Yeah, for other people too. Yeah. And you we just don't seem to think that way. Whenever we come to things that we go, well, I'm pretty sure I know that this is the case. Well, you may not be so pretty in the end, but how common is that for us to do? So consider this your five alarm warning because I want you to see, and I may remind you of this from time to time, what's going to happen from this point forward with Paul for the next four and a half to five years is because of a supposition. I want you to think about that. Paul's going to spend two years in jail in Caesarea. Paul's going to spend two years with guards in Rome, all because of somebody's supposition. Do we ever think when we suppose things of going, boy, this is really going to turn out terrible? Now, how do we feel about supposition? I'm pretty sure I'm right. That's the way we should think about it. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes those are the best words to say. People want to ask about certain things, and you go, I just don't know. And we usually go, I got to guess. <laughs> but I don't know. Then, so notice that part, verse 30. He says, then all the city was provoked. Everybody else gets on board. He's, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. You can kind of imagine him coming through the doors and just, boom, they just locked it up. And the, notice they drag him out. I mean, they laid hands on him. They drag him out of the temple, verse 31, while they were seeking to kill him. Can you imagine if somebody died because of your supposition? Whew. I'm telling you, it's dangerous, dangerous. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander. He's a Chiliarch. In other words, he's over a thousand other men. Uh, he's Roman, you'll see. To the commander of the, of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. A report comes to him, and now what's this report? The whole city's going nuts. He says, you better come and deal with this. And you realize, once again, another supposition. And you talk about, you've already getting on top of, of incorrect, on top of incorrect. Do you expect this to get better or worse? You're right. Good supposition. Now, verse 32. At once he took along some soldiers, and he is the commander, and centurions, and ran down to them. Notice, they're hopping to get down there. They're not just lazy and on over. They ran down to them, and when they saw the commander, they, this mob, saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Saul. Notice, they had laid hands on him in the temple. They dragged him out of the temple, and when they got out, they were deciding that they wanted to kill him, but they were going to start him off with a good beating. All because of a supposition. Verse 33. Then the commander came up and took hold of him, took hold of Paul. Do you remember what Agabus' prophecy was? He says, you will be bound. He says, and you will be handed over from the Jews to the Gentiles. He says, you're not going to die at the hand of the Jews. Can you imagine, here's Paul being beaten and going, Agabus said I'm not going to die by the hands of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And whenever he, gets hand, whenever he sees the commander and gets handed over to the commander, what did Paul know? 
Spirit of God was right in what Agabus said. You ever get con convictions or reassurances in the midst of difficulties to go, you know what, God is right. It doesn't necessarily mean, okay, everything's pretty, but to go, he's right. And there are times, it doesn't say that Paul thought that. I'm just saying that that would be valid, a valid thought. And then, of course, you notice, then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Well, what do you know? I wonder if he was bound hand and foot. He says, and he began asking who he was and what he had done. <laughs> Finally, somebody who actually talks to the person. Isn't that something? It took a Roman to do this. Or at least a Roman chiliarch commander. He says, he began asking who he was and what he had done. What'd you do? <laughs> What'd you do to get all these people stirred up like this? Verse 34. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. Whenever he can't find out the facts, he doesn't go, oh, forget it. He says, I better take you even closer into protective custody and come on into the barracks. Verse 35. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. I mean... What is this telling you? I mean, they really did intend to kill him. But you see God use these Roman soldiers to protect Paul. Can God use anybody he wants to? Yes. Verse 36. For the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting, away with him. Did you just have a flashback? To Jesus. What were they saying about Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. Well, now here they are with Paul. And all these troublemakers that came from, came from, from Asia, and how they stir up not only the Jews in the temple, they stir up the whole town. Some people just seem to stir things up in an ungodly way. Be careful that that's not us. And understand the severity and the seriousness of it. Because it'll affect people in ways you cannot imagine. It is possible. Well, we have that right now. I mean, that hasn't, you know. The that hasn't changed. We have it right now. You know, make a riot and then, then end up the half the people are not even from that town. Not even from it. Then just notice, once again, in 36, the multitude of the people kept following them. Notice the mob just follows these soldiers as they're carrying Paul up the stairs to the barracks. And all this, and the crowd's saying a couple different things, and it doesn't mention any of them except for what's at the end of verse 36. Away with him. And you can think about, I wonder, you know, sometimes you don't always have the clarity at the moment. But as Paul's being carried by these soldiers up the stairs into the barracks to safety of going, it's amazing how the Lord has taken care of me. And sometimes it just takes looking back over events to realize that and to go, wow. Now, we're going to stop there for today because at this point forward, it really takes a, a move even further. And you're going to see this story just keep on going. Uh, as we go through the rest of the book of Acts. Brent will be here to, to teach for in the, book of, in the month of March, and then hopefully I'll be back in April. So, all right, have a good week.